We're looking at uh, Ruth chapter 1, starting at verse 1 through verse 22, and then Ruth chapter 4, starting at verse 13. Will you follow along as I read? In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and his two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malan and Kilin. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha, the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malan and Kilin were also, also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters, daughter-in-laws, she left the place where they had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, we will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have Any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it's more better for me than for you because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them, and the women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. When he made love to her, the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Please be to the Lord who who this day has not left you without a guardian redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word. This time, Jim. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to the book of Ruth. Now, the only one that's going to get this story is not here today, so let's see if you get it. Computer salesman, hardware engineer, and a software engineer are driving their car together. Suddenly, the right rear tire blows out. Car pulls over, stops. These three men get out to uh, take a look. The salesman in the group says, man, that's a bummer. I guess we'll have to buy a new car. The hardware engineer suggests, no, 
Let's first swap the front tires with the rear tires, see if that does any good. <laughs> Software engineer says to the other guys, nah, let's just try driving the car again and maybe the problem will just go away by itself. See, you're laughing because you basically understand that better than I do. Do you think God is still in the business of doing miracles today? Not with a car, but with us. If we are knowledgeable about what's going on in our world, and especially what's happening in different parts of Christendom around the world, we could say a resounding yes. But the great question then becomes, what about us? What about here? What about the local community? And is he doing miracles in our lives? We stop and think about it, and we can answer maybe, you know, like maybe, possibly, I suppose, I don't know. I have good news for you. I think that God has miracles that are yet untapped and are just sitting there waiting for us to hold into those and grab into that and gain strength from those that are available from God. But our problem is that we often think that for a miracle to happen, that it has to be out of the ordinary, thus leaving so many of God's miracles unused. And often we are like the preacher who got caught in a flood. And the water is rising around the church and finally reaches the steps of the church. And a rescue boat floats up and floats by and the rescuers shout, get in, preacher. The water is continuing to rise. You're going to drown. You need to get in. The preacher responds by saying, I've got faith. God will save me. Don't need the ride. So the water continues to rise. Next time, the preacher is in the second floor looking out the window at the water when the rescue boat comes by a second time and the men said, Preacher, the water is continuing to rise. You need to get in the boat or you're going to drown. And again, the preacher said, Nope, I, I have faith. I trust God. The Lord's going to save me. And uh, the water continued to rise. So eventually, the preacher found himself up on the roof straddling the roof and the rescue boat came paddling by and said get in preacher the water's still rising you're going to drown the preacher said no i've got faith i know the lord will save me but the water continued to rise and the preacher drowned he stood in heaven before the lord and said lord i had faith why didn't you save me and the lord replies what do you mean I sent a rescue boat three times. That's the end of the, the end. You're welcome. Okay. So the question is, is are you missing the miracle? Do I have to send it three times? In the upper room, Jesus warned his disciples, in the world you will have pressure, but in me you will find peace. All of us want less pressure and a lot more peace. The word Jesus uses here is the idea of pressure, the idea of pressing on something. Uh, in pressing upon us is maybe the burden that is upon us, and maybe it's the burdens of the Spirit. To, to the issue of tension, we could always say, well, all of you have experienced this, been there, done that. You've all experienced tension in your life. In a magazine poll conducted by Princeton Research, 65% of those polled said they had great stress at least one day a week. That's interesting, it's up from 1983 when it was only 55% of people said that. And how do you offset some of that stress? Well, some people say, well, I watch TV, or I read, or I listen to the music, or I listen to the radio. Uh, other people say, well, I talk to my spouse, or my parent, or my close friend. Other people say, well, I play sports or I, I, I go for a long walk. Somebody else says, well, there are people out there that smoke and drink. Some other people out there, like one third, say, we just go shopping. Recently, after speaking to a meeting of County Medical Society, a speaker rode to the airport with three of the doctors that were there at the meeting, and so he's driving, or he's riding with them as they take him back to the airport. And he goes through a neighborhood of sparkling, beautiful, beautiful homes. And he comments about, man, that's quite a community. That's quite a beautiful homes that are right here. And there's a startled response from these three doctors who hear him and they say, those beautiful homes hide a great deal of illness. 
This is one of the sickest communities that we've ever seen. They keep us doctors on our toes working day and night. And the sad part is, is that we are fighting a losing battle because the physical complaints that these people pre present are basically symptoms of a crazy, mixed-up society where everybody is sort of striving, and they're striving for the wrong stuff. These people don't need physical care as much as they need spiritual care. As doctors, we, we hesitate to do that. We, hate to, we hesitate to even give that kind of advice because we don't feel that it's in our bailiwick to be able to do that. In fact, we have bent over backwards in the past to say that our patients' moral lives are none of our business. Now, we are not quite sure about that. So here we are tinkering with bodies that need adjustment as if we are mechanics in a garage shop. We are not just talking about diet or sleep. We're talking about the lack of stability in their homes. There's envy and jealousy and moral laxity, and there's bickering and fighting. These people don't know what inner stability is all about. They just keep wanting, wanting something. There's got to be something more out there. They keep buying things on credit, things that they don't need. They just buy everything in sight. They always want something. They, they have never heard of the idea of self-discipline or sacrifice. And we would say that's just a, too big of a job for us to do alone. We as doctors need help. Managing the stress and tensions of life is a frequent topic. Every magazine will have something about that. Every book, every workshop, every seminar is dealing with the idea of how do you deal with tension today. Everyone wants to learn the way of making life simpler. Ultimately, though, is that it comes down that we have a choice. Either we let the tensions of life destroy us, or we use the stress and tension positively to improve the quality of our lives. Let's take a look at this. Let's look at the aspect of tension. We're in Ruth chapter 1. We are introduced today to our source of miracles through the life of Ruth, and through Ruth's life, we learn that God's most effective miracle sources is coming through times of tension, times of stress. You look at chapter 1, verses 3, 4, and 5, and life seems to be going pretty good for, for Ruth, and then all of a sudden, disaster comes. Both her brother-in-law and her husband both die after Naomi had lost her husband. The question is, what do you do with life when life has dealt you sort of this, the feeling of sort of a, a losing hand? She's now a widow. She has no visible ways of support. To make matters worse, her mother-in-law is now going to leave and go back to her original country, back in Judah. Naomi told, tells Ruth that she is free to try to make a life for herself, to go back to her own country of Moab. What could she do? She had tried to remarry, but sometimes individuals hold a dim view of someone who has married a foreigner. And besides, when Ruth became a part of Naomi's family, she witnessed for the first time in her life a true God, the real God, and not just worshiping idols. So she chose to leave her homeland. She, she chose to leave her birth family, her friends from childhood, and go to a strange country and with only one person that she knew, and that's Naomi. And Naomi's mother, uh, Ruth's mother-in-law was not the most pleasant person at this time because of her own grief. It was a time of real tension. But the tension didn't ease when they arrived in Bethlehem. Certainly Naomi was back home, but she and Ruth had no money, no food, probably no other resources. But out of that tension, God provided a miracle in Ruth's life. In other words, here's a good sign. It's like the uh, story of the 67-year-old man that is watching his factory burn down. He doesn't have enough money to cover it in terms of his insurance. His son comes up to him and says, he is, uh, he's about 67 years old, and his son comes up to him and says, man, are you okay? And, 
And his, and his father says, listen, go get your mom. She needs to see this. She's never going to see a fire like this. And uh, the next morning, the old man gathers all his employees and look at the charred ruins and said, there's great value in disaster. All of our mistakes are burned up. And we can start anew, thank God. That was a guy named Thomas Edison. And in three weeks, he would turn out his first phonograph. Disaster and disappointment can destroy us or it can refine us. You go to chapter 4 of Ruth. We skip over the end of the book and we see that Boaz became Ruth's relative by marriage. They have a son whom they call Obed. Obed has a son whom they call Jesse. And of Jesse's sons, there's the youngest was David and great-grandmother is Ruth. And of course, David will then become the king, the great-grandmother to a king. Ruth is the only one of four women listed in the New Testament genealogy of Jesus. It was a miracle, and it, would have happened, it wouldn't have happened if Ruth had gone through, hadn't gone through the tense times that she experienced in Moab. Is God still in the miracle business? Yes, and some of his greatest miracles take place when we're going through unbelievable stress. Turn over to Judges chapter 7. Tension can be utilized to identify unnecessary sources of emotional expenditure. Tension can be using emotional energy, what guilt is to our spiritual, what pain is to physical. In other words, as guilt warns us about sin, guilt warns us about sin, that we need forgiveness, pain warns us about sickness or disease that needs treatment, tension can warn us unnecessary, about unnecessary expenditures of emotional energy. In Judges chapter 7, God assisted Gideon as he confronted the tension and the pressures of the battle that he was going to deal with. And he, what he was doing is that he had to deal with non-essentials to the battle. In other words, what Gideon needed to do was not to encumber himself with soldiers that weren't going to fight. In other words, soldiers that were fearful. Soldiers that wanted to be back with their families. Nor those physical needs that distracted from what they needed to do in terms of facing the enemy. So he ends up with only 300 soldiers. And you all know the story of how Gideon subdues Israel's enemies. It's interesting, out of this, there will be then peace for the next 40 years. All of us carry excess baggage. Tension used properly can help us confront some of those non-essentials in your life. What are you doing? What are you doing that you could leave undone? What good things can be eliminated to enhance the better things that vie for your attention? In John chapter 15, verse 2, Jesus said, Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it may be even more fruitful. Moses, when he was serving as judge, had people standing around from morning till evening wanting to talk to him. He's the only guy. In Exodus chapter 18, the advice of his father-in-law, Jethro, Moses learned the art of delegation. Not only was Moses' burden lightened, but others now had the joy of being a part of serving there in the beginnings of the nation of Israel. Sometimes our overworking robs others of opportunities to contribute. What are you doing that someone else could do instead? Tension properly heated can be a positive tool for increasing the quality of your own life. It's like the man who's, there's a guy who's, uh, he's watching a cocoon. Have you ever seen cocoons and chrysalis? And this cocoon was for, not for butterfly, but this is for the emperor moth. And he noticed that it's there and it's uh, striving to get out of the cocoon. And he watches, he's fascinated, he sits there, and as this moth is struggling to get out, and it seems like it's in a small prison. And after a while, the man decides what well, something must be wrong because the moth stopped moving, wasn't doing much, and so the moth just couldn't seem to go any further and was still caught in the cocoon. So what he did is he took out a pair of small scissors 
and he made a cut in the cocoon. And soon the moth emerged. Its body, however, was large and swollen while its wings were tiny, completely unbalanced. In other words, the moth needed that time to fight its way out of the tight space in order to develop the wings, to push the fluid from the body into the wings that they would grow. In other words, the help that the man had offered, as good as his intentions were, actually ruined the life of the moth. You see, dear people, God knows when struggle is what we need to develop normally, to become stronger. And he can use even the hard times in life to create something beautiful in us. Look at number three, the inevitable tension of this. Turn with me to Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11. Some tension in life is inevitable. There's little or nothing we can do to eliminate it. It's like the doctor who said to his patient, you need to eliminate stress from your life. And the response was, I can't. I'm a pastor's wife. Stress goes with the job. In Acts chapter 8 and 11, we see powerful results of persecution of the early church. And believers were motivated to move beyond their comfort zone. Until persecution came, the followers of Jesus basically were comfortable. We can go and gather and meet and they are content. But then persecution happens in Jerusalem. What happens to the church in Jerusalem? They begin to scatter. They go out to Judea, then out to Samaria, further advancing what Christ had told them to do, the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 11, verse 19, he says, They preached the good news, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began... What did they begin telling? What did they begin to say? Boy, you should be with us when the persecution happened. Man, it was rough. No, that's not what they said. What does it say there? They began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was upon them, and there were then numbers of now Gentiles who believed and turned to the Lord. Here were people that were completely outside of their framework outside of their window of their lives. And so they preached the Lord wherever they went. And now Jews and Greeks were now being told the good news about the Lord Jesus. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Now the question is, would the Jerusalem church have carried out such an ambitious mission program? On just, on just their own? It's question mark. We could say probably not. Would the Jerusalem church have done this? But a, a, but a live and vibrant faith asked how might God use this tension that they were going to to now bring further glory to him and to highlight, give glory to the name of Christ. The tension of Paul's past motivated him to rely upon God's grace in ways he might never have trusted. And through Paul, Christ displayed his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. And 1 Timothy goes on to respond with a doxology of praise to say, thank you, God, for what you have done. James, James taught the idea that the testing of your faith does something to you. It builds your inner character. So God uses the tensions of life to bring us to maturity and completeness so that you and I lack nothing. In other words, pressure can produce intimacy. Pressures of life often drive us into creative ways of showing, which include maybe, maybe it's just listening to good music. Maybe it's just reading a good book. Maybe it's physical exercise. Maybe it's a conversation with someone that you can share with and be able to be vulnerable with. It's interesting, during the 1975 World Series, anybody here was at that? Okay. Uh, an NBC cameraman was unnerved by a rat that was circling him at his post in Fenway Park with the Boston Red Sox. 
And so consequently, in that, many of you have seen this, instead of focusing his camera on the ball that had been hit by Carlton Fisk down the left field line, he forgot about his camera as he's worried about the rat, and he leaves the camera focused on Carlton Fisk, who is doing this. See, some of you were actually saw that. And it became one of the greatest baseball clips of all time. That mistake captured a close-up of Fisk as he was jumping up and down and waving his arms, trying to coax his ball to stay on the fair side of the foul pole over the big green monster. But Paul did stay fair. Fisk hit a home run and won the game in extra innings. If it hadn't been for the tenseness of the situation that that cameraman was in, he wouldn't have caught that great, wonderful shot of what was taking place in the excitement. We need to watch for how those tense situations that we experience can turn out for good. Most importantly, tension often drives us to our knees, to a deeper fellowship with God, who alone can ease our tension. Seldom will we experience God's miracle touch as we do when we cast our cares on him. We so easily forget that the length of time God permits us to live here is not related to a certain amount of work that he has you to do. Understand this. You're not here just to complete a job. What God does and why he keeps you here is for you to have a certain closeness of relationship to him that he wants you to attain. He wants you to draw closer to himself. That's why you're here. He is the great reliever of tension. And he is the great giver of peace. Many of us, like Ruth, are in the midst of stress and tension-filled times. Many of us could use a miracle. But you know, like Ruth, you and I have a redeemer. Ruth received her miracle because she was committed to God, because she continued on doing what God was desiring her to do, and because she had a kinsman redeemer. How can we appropriate a miracle in our life and make stress work for us? Well, let me just give you one clue here. The first thing I think you need to do, and that's what that purple sheet is, is you need to pray. And you need to pray through that sheet. There are verses there. It should be a time of commitment and a prayer that reflects our belief in this God that has given you those verses. That God is capable and willing and even in the process of making a miracle of the tensions that you are going through. You could pray very similar to this. Right now, Lord, I feel tension because of you fill in the blank. I turn this situation over to you knowing that you love me and you'll control my days. Help me to live believing in you constantly. You're working in my behalf. And let me be on the lookout. Let me be on the lookout for evidence of your miracle. You see, stress robs us of our focus and inhibits our performance. But pressure is negative only when we are ill-prepared. In other words, it can bring about an extraordinary accomplishments. Isn't it, what are the athletes that do? Isn't the athletes that perform best under pressure? They're going to do it this summer in the Olympics. So set some goals. Begin viewing tension positively. Manage it in constructive ways and let God use it. Let God use it in your life to make you stronger as you follow him. Let me close with this. Among the ancient Greeks, the runner who crossed the, who was the winner of the race was not the man who crossed the finish line in the shortest time, but it was the man who crossed the finish line in the least time with his torch still burning. None of us will ever live a tension-free life. But all of us with God's help can experience a life lived for his glory with our lives still burning bright through the power of the Spirit.
that lives inside us. May that be our goal. Let's bow in prayer. As your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed, are there certain areas of your life that you need to release to God? Has God been pointing these areas in your life? That you need to release fear, maybe fear of the future. You need to release anger. You need to release concerns about relationships in the family. You need to release a busy schedule. You need to release anxiety about children or grandchildren. You need to release grief or sadness. You need to release financial stress. You need to release there's areas of your job or your marriage or your health. But with that, are you also willing to receive from God? Are you welcoming his peace? Are you welcoming by depending upon trust in him? Are you welcoming increased faith? Are you welcoming a will that is submissive to what God wants to do in your life? Are you willing to receive love and the joy that God wants to put in you? Are you willing to see a life free to worship God and to follow him? Lord, may we release, may we receive, and may we be on the lookout for the evidence of your miracle touch in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.